Hey guys, let's take a look today at the semicolon and the colon. Let's start with the colon. By the way, these topics are found on uh, pages 62 through 65 in your small textbook, A Pocket Style Manual, 8th edition. All right, the colon. Main uses of the colon are, a colon can be used after an independent clause to direct readers' attention to a list and a positive, and a positive is a noun or a noun phrase that sits next to another noun to rename it or to describe it in another way, or a quotation. Let's look at these three, three cases within which colons are used. Our first example shows a list in red here. Notice that I have my directions um, indicate the three uses of the colon, and the first use is a list, and I put that in red, and it's red here. A positive is in green, and a quotation is in orange. Let's look at a list first. Examples. A list. Don't forget to include these, colon, a picture of your family, your favorite book, and a statement of your greatest concern. The second example is the use of a colon with an appositive. This is probably the, the least familiar word of these three. Um, for most students, uh, I think we all are um, familiar with a list. We know what a list is, and so we can remember that when we're introducing a list, we want to precede it with a colon. Um, and then the second one that was called an appositive, which was probably something that was taught in high school or maybe even middle school, but, um, you know, who remembers such things? So uh, let's look at an appositive where a colon is used in this example. According to Stephen King, good writing requires two things, colon, lots of reading and lots of writing. So what is an appositive? If I go back up here to my description and directions, it says the main uses are a list of an appositive and a quotation. What is an appositive? An appositive is a noun or noun phrase that sits next to another noun to rename it or describe it. Okay, so in this case, the appositive R is the word things. Let's look at this. According to Stephen King, good writing requires two things. Those things are now described or renamed next. So our appositive includes the word to, I guess, technically as well, because it is a noun phrase. So to things. Now let me describe those things, or colon, lots of reading and lots of writing. So we use it between and a positive. And the third direction, or the third example is uh, the use of a colon for a quotation or to introduce a quotation. Regarding plot, Dibble said it best, colon, there are ways to create, fix, steer, and discover plots. Ways which, over a writing life, you'd eventually puzzle out for yourself. So here we have a quote, obviously, because it's in quotation marks, and it's preceded with a colon. Now, this can be confusing because, for example, when we read a, a typical novel, uh, quotes are not usually or hardly ever introduced with a colon. Why is that? Well, the reason for that is because in a novel, the writer usually writes something like, John said, comma, and then we have the quote. In this case, it says, regarding plot, Dibble said it best. Notice it doesn't just say, Dibble said, and then there's the quote. If that would be the case, then we would just say, Dibble said, comma, there are ways. But this says, regarding plot, Dibble said it best colon. What, let me think of another example. Um, John Wayne, comma, a famous American cowboy figure, comma, 
often made the following state uh, made the following quotes and then we would have a colon and then those quotes or that quote now if i said john wayne a uh, common american cowboy figure was frequently heard saying comma quote okay so whenever we introduce a quotation with said or exclaimed or something like that we use a comma but if we're not introducing a quote with those types of words, then we, we use a colon. Okay, an additional thing here regarding colon. A colon may be used between independent clauses, and this should be familiar from our last mini lesson on commas and independent clauses. Again, a colon may be used between independent clauses if the second clause summarizes or explains the first clause. Here's a good example of that. I left my heart in San Francisco. It's still there today. I left my heart in San Francisco. It's still there today. Now, notice that both of these are independent clauses. I left my heart in San Francisco. It's still there today. Those are independent clauses. Okay. And we can use a, a colon between two independent clauses if the second one summarizes or explains the first one. It's almost like, in a way, renaming it or adding additional information. And that's what we're doing here. I left my heart in San Francisco, colon, it's still there today. In this note says, when an independent clause follows a colon, begin the independent clause with a capital letter. So notice here that these both of these independent clauses that are divided by a colon, both start with a capital letter. The reason for that is because what is an independent clause? It's a sentence, right, that can stand alone. And so since it is a sentence, we always want to start it with a capital letter. What are some common mistakes when using colons? Well, because a colon has to be preceded by an independent clause, don't make the mistake of placing a colon between a verb and its object or complement. So that's a lot of, that's a mouthful of words. What do we mean by that? Well, let's look at this example. My best friends are John, Kara, and Nancy. So what we've done here is we've placed a colon between what? A verb, are, and the object, we don't want to do the object in this case is a list of three of my favorite or my best friends. So this sort of goes with um, what I discussed up here um, with the use of a colon. If you have two independent clauses, those independent clauses start with a capital letter in both cases because they are sentences. Okay. This is not an independent clause, and it is not because it, it's not a complete sentence. You're not going to see a sentence that says, my best friends are, right? So you want to make sure that you don't put a colon between a verb and its complement, the sentence's complement. So how do we correct this? This is how we could do it in two ways. We could simply say, I have three best friends, colon, John, Kara, and Nancy. Notice I took the R out of there, right? Because what I did is I created an independent clause here to precede the colon. Or you could say, my three best friends are John, comma, Kara, comma, and Nancy. So we just, we just create an independent clause by putting those together and taking out the colon. All right, so that's the information on the use of a colon. Let's go to a semicolon here. A semicolon looks familiar to a colon, a colon being two dots, one on top of the other or above the other. A semicolon is a dot and a comma, the dot being above the comma. The semicolon is used between independent clauses not joined with a coordinating conjunction. Let me say that again. The semicolon is used between independent clauses not joined with a coordinating conjunction. Though a comma is usually used to link two coordinating conjunctions, if the relation is clear without a conjunction, remember a conjunction is typically fanboys for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. So, <clears throat> again, 
If the relation is clear without a conjunction, a writer may choose to connect the clauses with a semicolon instead. So the short version of that long explanation is, if I have two coordinating conjunctions that are divided by, excuse me, if I have two independent clauses that are divided by a coordinating conjunction, I can go ahead and use that coordinating conjunction and keep it as it is, or I could in many cases use a semicolon instead. So I would take that coordinating conjunction out and replace it with a semicolon. Okay. So the question may be, how do I know whether I should use fanboys, one of the coordinating conjunctions to, to bring together two independent clauses, or should I use a semicolon? Well, honestly, many times you can use either many times, but, but kind of a rule that I try to adhere to when I'm writing is, and I'm asking myself, should I use one of the coordinating conjunctions or should I instead use a semicolon? I, I only use, I use a semicolon not nearly as often because when I'm using a semicolon, colon, it's because of this right here. If the relationship is clear without a conjunction, I want to make sure not only that the relationship is clear, but it's very clear without a conjunction. Otherwise, I'm just going to use a, a conjunction and, and, and keep things real clear that way and be safe in my writing. So let's look at an example here. I can't stand an air conditioner in the dead of winter, semicolon. The summer is another story altogether. Okay, so is there another way we could write that? Yes, we could say, I can't stand an air conditioner in the dead of winter, comma, but the summer is another story altogether. Both of these examples are fine. They're both okay for writing. And it's very difficult to describe, though I think as a reader, you, you feel the difference between those two sentences. Again, let me use the coordinating conjunction first. I can't stand an air conditioner in the dead of winter, but the summer is another story altogether. Now, let me say the same thing using a semicolon and deleting the coordinating conjunction. I can't stand an air conditioner in the dead of winter. The summer is another story altogether. It's almost like when you use the semicolon, you are highlighting something that's opposing what you said first. It's sort of a, more of like a punctuation or or a very important difference that you're saying. So there are, there, there's, a, there's a different feel to using a coordinating conjunction as opposed to a semicolon. And it, this is one of those things that you just become familiar with the more you read. All right. Note, a semicolon must be used whenever a coordinating conjunction does not appear between independent clauses. To merely use a comma creates an error known as a comma splice, another one of those things you were probably taught and maybe once or twice and, you know, who, who remembers what this stuff means? Well, splice means split. So in other words, you can't simply split two independent clauses with a comma without either a coordinating conjunction or a semicolon. Example, I can't stand an air conditioner in the dead of winter, comma, the summer is another story altogether. This is incorrect. You cannot do that. This is called a comma splice. How do we fix it? Well, we could do it in one of three ways. First of all, we could simply divide these independent clauses into separate sentences by putting a period at the end of the first one. I can't stand an air conditioner in the dead of winter, period. The summer is another story altogether. Or we could use a coordinating conjunction to bring together these two independent clauses. I can't stand an air conditioner in the dead of winter, but the summer is another story altogether. Or the third way would be the semicolon. I can't stand an air conditioner in the dead of winter. The summer is another story altogether. Since the relation between the two clauses is very clear, the most effective choice is number three. Now, because that's the most effective choice, just because of that, doesn't mean that it's the only choice or that's, that it's the only correct choice. All three of these are fine. 
Okay, so when you're when you're doing the homework assignment and you're trying to decide how to fix a sentence if it needs fixing, um, you may be confused because you're like, well, I could do it this way. Can't I do it that way too? And, and it may be true that you could do it two or three ways. And if that's the case, just show me one of them, one of the correct ways to fix that sentence. All right, let's look at common mistakes. Do not use a semicolon between an a positive and the word it refers to, okay? Do not use a semicolon between an appositive and the word it refers to. Remember, we talked about an appositive being a noun or a noun phrase that renames or is renamed by what follows it. So let's take a look at this example. He backed into the Maserati, semicolon, a very expensive car. So you, do, you don't want to use a semicolon between an appositive and the descriptor. But here's how you could correct it. He backed into the Maserati, colon, a very expensive car. Yeah, we use a colon, just like we talked about up here when we were discussing a colon. So when you're, when you're looking at an appositive and it renames something, that's what makes it an appositive, and you don't want to use a semicolon. Instead, you want to use a colon for that, okay? Also, do not use a semicolon to introduce a list. Remember, we introduced a list. That's one of the first things we talked about with a colon. We use a colon to introduce a list, not a semicolon. So an example, I've read two of her books, Semicolon, The Common March, and Sailing Without Sails. These are the two books, The Common March, and another one, Sailing Without Sails. We're introducing a list here, even though it's only two, it's still a list, but we don't want to use a semicolon to introduce a list. Here's how you would correct it. I read two of her books, colon, The Common March, and Sailing Without Sails. Okay. That's a lot of information, um, a little bit more than what we talked about with commas, but um, it's not terribly bad, I don't think. All right, so the example, or excuse me, the um, directions here say, copy and paste the following, by the following, I mean, one through 10. Examine the sentences for misuse of the colon or the semicolon and make any necessary corrections. Necessary corrections. If the sentence is correct as it is shown, just type no change at the end of the sentence. Okay. And I don't remember how many of these, but at least, I believe, one or two, maybe three. Okay, don't quote me, but uh, uh, at least I think two of these are, at least two of them are correct as they are. So... At the end of those, you're just going to want to put no change, okay? All right, thanks, guys. Good luck to you.